Imagine an alternate history 1980 at the height of the Cold War. Things between NATO and the Warsaw Pact get out of control. Political tensions turn into skirmishes. Both sides mobilize. And after a few months, the unthinkable happens, as skirmishes give way to larger-scale attacks. Suddenly, NATO countries find themselves on the receiving end of a massive Warsaw Pact offensive. Masses of Soviet tanks have often been portrayed as unstoppable. So this video will focus on just that. Could such a mass tank rush drive NATO forces out to the Atlantic Ocean? It's not easy to project who'd win a war in 1980. Binkov will try, but you can try it for yourself, by playing Conflict of Nations, which has a brand new Cold War game mode out. Its map is set in the 1980s, and it features historically accurate borders. Play against up to 32 other players and lead a real country in this period of tension between superpowers. Conflict of Nations is a free online PvP strategy. It's a slow and methodical game, and matches can take weeks to complete. You can play with the same account on both PC and mobile. To give that Cold War map a try, simply click on the link in the description. You'll also get an exclusive gift, 13,000 gold and one month of premium subscription for free. Make that Cold War go hot and try it out! Let us get back to the year 1980. First off, the numbers. Back then, the Soviet Union and other Warsaw Pact countries had a lot of tanks. Very precise figures are impossible to attain, but from the history of production of various tanks and various papers estimating the balance of power, like the US Congressional Report Service, a rough breakdown of tank figures can be estimated. The T-10 tank was a very early Cold War design, a vestige of the old World War II IS lineage of tanks. T-54s were simple medium-weight tanks, originally from the end of the 1940s, but by the year 1980, many were modernized with new radios, rangefinders and other equipment. Still, the T-54 family was essentially hampered by poor sights and a weak gun. On the fairly modern battlefield of 1980s, the T-54 family would have been relegated to infantry support duty at close ranges and would struggle against the M60 or Leopard 1. T-62s were just a bit more advanced in production from early 1960s, with a serviceable gun and gun stabilization, but still lagging behind in the sights and sensor department, and poorly armored by 1980 standards. The vastly upgraded M variant came later, a few years into the 1980s. The tip of the spear for the Soviet push into Europe would have definitely been the T-64 and T-72 tanks. The T-64 in particular was the tank for the elite units. Mass production of a definitive A variant started in the late 1960s. It had a powerful gun, it was very well armored, and for the first time featured an autoloader. Its sights, rangefinders and stabilization systems were the best the Soviets could muster, and the models were fairly frequently upgraded. Indeed, the T-64B, which entered service in small numbers in the late 1970s, was near the pinnacle of Soviet tank design and rivaled the T-80 in capabilities. The T-80 was an amalgam of T-64 and T-72 features, and back when it started its service in the late 70s was no better than the T-64. The T-72 was devised to gradually replace older tanks such as the T-54 and T-62. It was a good tank for its time. Its powerful gun and low silhouette could be very dangerous especially against opponents lacking guided weapons or ballistic computers for longer-range engagements. The PT-76 was a very light amphibious tank, meant to perform niche roles, and certainly not meant to go against a fortified NATO frontline. The Soviet Union thus had some 10,000 modern tanks, and a vast number of second echelon tanks to overwhelm the defenders with numbers, as many as 40,000 such tanks. Other Warsaw Pact countries mostly relied on the T-54, as the T-64 and T-80 were off-limits. The T-72 was marketed to them as the top-of-the-line model, but it was available in small numbers back then. Some 200 PT-76 light tanks were also operated by them. Overall, the entire Warsaw Pact 
had something like 63,000 various tanks. But let's put those figures in some perspective. A lot of army units, including tank units, were mobilization category units. They were stored to be manned and mobilized when needed. Also, the Soviet Union had other areas to defend, not just Europe. There was the Caucasus that had to be defended from a possible Turkish-led NATO charge. There was the big underbelly of various countries in Central Asia. There was Japan in the Far East, with the US troops stationed there. And then there was China. By the late 1950s, relations between China and USSR soured. The Soviets regarded China as an adversary. It certainly did not help that the West was increasingly cuddling up to China in the 70s. That included weapon technology transfers. In 1979, when China went to war with Vietnam, it feared a Soviet reaction. While the bigger war did not happen, there was mistrust on the borders and the Soviets held one million various military personnel alongside their border with China during much of the 70s. In the early 1980s, the Soviet army maintained one-fourth of its forces near China. So while this video assumes months of prep time for the Soviet Union to amass its tanks for Europe, there would still be some forces not available for the European campaign. It would not be unrealistic to expect at least 10,000 tanks being held up in reserve against possible trouble with China. While the speed of mobilization would impact both sides, that's too complex of a topic for this video. Here we will assume that in the months preceding the war, NATO countries managed to bring most but not all of their troops to Europe. For those looking for more details on mobilization issues over the initial months of the war, we recommend our 1989 NATO vs Warsaw Pact videos. Not counting the US and Canadian forces, NATO had a decent number of tanks in Europe. But their figures were lagging behind Soviet ones, and a big chunk of those tanks were 30-year-old designs. The Leopard 2 was a state-of-the-art tank, but only a hundred were available back then. The Leopard 1 was the most used European tank back then. A decent design when it came to firepower and mobility, coupled with advanced systems for gun stabilization, a fire computer and even a separate site for the commander, which Soviet tanks for the most part lacked. But its Achilles heel was very weak armor for its time. The French-made AMX-30 followed a very similar design philosophy, though technologically it was lagging behind the Leopard 1 back then. The US-made M60 was a heavier tank than those two, and only Italy used it outside the US. Modernized British Centurions and US M48s were roughly comparable to Soviet T-55s and T-62s, and could not be counted on to go head-to-head -head with newer Soviet tanks. Though in a Soviet tank rush, there would inevitably be situations where some older NATO tanks could be performing flank attacks on enemy formations. The M47 was for the most part a third-line tank, nearly obsolete, a lacking modern equipment and even a decent gun. The French-made AMX-13 filled a niche role, a very light tank. The countries shown also used 870 old US-made very light scout tanks, such as the M24. The list is complete with the British-made Chieftain, a 1960s design, a heavier tank than the Leopard 2 and probably the third best tank NATO had back then. But just as the Soviet Union had forces split apart, even the European countries could not put their entire forces in West Germany. Greece and Turkey were cut off from land routes. The Caucasus front had to be held. And there was the inter-rivalry between the two due to the 1974 Turkish invasion of Cyprus. So it's not unreasonable to expect that most of those two countries' forces would stay where they are or push into Bulgaria, as that southern flank of the Warsaw Pact was pretty weak. Romania, for example, did not even allow Soviet troops stationed on its soil. Norway would also likely stay put and defend the northern reaches, probably even requiring US reinforcements. The US troops would have featured prominently in Europe, of course. There were five divisions worth of troops stationed in Europe to begin with, and some further 11 divisions worth of troops had equipment stored around Europe or were quick reaction units. Nominally, the US tank force was smaller than Europe's, but not by much. And quantitatively, it was a bit better on average. 
the M1 was state of the art back then. The basic M60 variant was comparable to the T62, while the A3 variant rivaled T72. The M551 Sheridan filled a niche role of an airdropped light tank, but its powerful gun fired lethal guided anti-tank missiles. Given the allotted time, most US units could be expected to join NATO in Europe. But while the Warsaw Pact might field twice as many tanks as NATO near West Germany, it's not the NATO tanks that would be the main problem for the Soviet rush anyway. It would be a combination of many factors. Here are just some. The territory of West Germany was not very big. It was some 460 miles wide between the Austrian mountains and the North Sea. Then it got narrower as one went westward. 360 miles from the Swiss border to the Dutch coast. And finally it was just 310 miles wide at its narrowest from the Swiss border to the Belgian coast. After which the area again started to widen, once in France. While fairly flat, West Germany and the Benelux are also quite developed and have a decent amount of forests. Fast movement of huge armored units through forests or settlements is not really possible. And those are perfect areas for infantry to level the playing field with armor, as soldiers can use anti-tank missiles there at fairly short ranges. While the Soviet doctrine did call for liberal use of artillery, rolling down fire in front of the advancing armor when needed, it still wouldn't really allow for lightning-quick tank rushes, if the areas would first need to be cleared. Clearing the urban rubble would be more or less impossible with artillery. The Warsaw Pact did have a lot of artillery pieces, as that was their main way of providing fire support. But actually moving them with the attack formation would be challenging. NATO would be controlling the airspace over its territory, and there would be a toss-up over the control of the frontline airspace, including both NATO and Warsaw Pact artillery positions. Basically, there would be cluster munitions used everywhere. Once again, a good chunk of Soviet planes would be tied around China, in case there was trouble there as well. With their ample in-flight refueling fleet, it's likely pretty much all of the US fighter and strike aircraft fleet could be moved to Europe. Both the US and the USSR would keep a lot of interceptor planes in their home territory, in case enemy bomber incursions needed to be stopped. As the Soviets would be on the move, they would not be able to enjoy full protection of their ample air defenses. NATO could use some, but not all of their fixed SAM sites to protect Germany. In the mobile SAM department, the Soviets outnumbered NATO by quite a bit, though some Soviet systems would be held back near China and other fronts. Adding to the fight, but likely suffering horrendous losses from Soviet air defenses, would also have been attack helicopters. The US had little over a thousand dedicated attack choppers. The Soviets would find their relative lack of range on small jets to be a big issue, especially coupled with the need to persist with their planes over a front line that keeps moving westward as they advance. Without clear control of the skies, the outcome of the land fight would not really come down to the tanks, but to the infantry. In that dense, fairly small battlefield of West Germany, there would simply be no room for utilize armored units' biggest advantage their mobility. Wherever they would go, there would be walls of enemy units. When the Soviets would break through a NATO line, there would be no way to take advantage of that breakthrough, as there would just be another and another line of defenses waiting right behind it. And indeed, when it comes to overall troop numbers, NATO was not behind the Warsaw Pact. With a total of some 2 million active service army troops in Europe, compounded by 900,000 US troops. The Warsaw Pact, without the USSR, had 800,000 troops. Thus the totals were similar, but given that NATO was defending, it would really take more than parity for the Soviets to make some serious headway. And it could be argued that the troops Soviets would need to keep in the Far East, Central Asia and around Turkey would outnumber the NATO troops needed in Turkey, Greece and the continental US. Reserves would also be mobilized, and in theory the Soviets counted on more men there, but exact useful figures are hard to assess. While nominally tens of millions of Soviets were to make themselves available for mobilization, 
actual figures of successfully mobilized men in a short time frame would have been less. The US had some 1.3 million of ready reserves, of which 400,000 were National Guardsmen. An unknown number of additional men to be mobilized in a short time frame. Western European countries were for the most part more prepared to mobilize reserves. When looking at the population pools, it becomes apparent that the Warsaw Pact would struggle to mobilize enough troops to achieve parity, let alone eclipse NATO. And even if the Soviets did mobilize a much greater percentage of their population, those would have been people with fairly poor military experience, last time serving 10 or more years ago. Furthermore, a greater percentage of Warsaw Pact troops were conscripts. Indeed, the Soviets readily planned to have their conscripts operate those masses of T-55 tanks. As history has shown in Arab-Israeli wars, having a well-trained tank crew is crucial. It can enable the tank to operate at a few times greater efficiency than if it was operated by conscripts with little training. While the NATO tank fleet was behind in cutting-edge tanks, it did have a lot of decent tanks. On the Warsaw Pact side, one can notice there was a definite rift between the good tanks operated by the elite well-trained units and the masses of cannon fodder armored units for the rest. Tanks like the Leopard 1, with their good sensors, would enable their crews to get hits first, as they waited hidden for the Soviet rush. Once spotted, they would be destroyed quickly, due to their poor armor. But the defensive nature of the NATO posture would play much more prominently when it comes to infantry. Not just because of their numbers, talked about earlier, but because of plentiful guided anti-tank missiles. A small infantry team could operate such a system, hidden in forests or urban centers, and engage tanks from a mile or more away. It was European countries in particular who put great early focus on such systems. Unlike with the US, their exact figures have to be estimated. Some rough figures are available for certain countries, but others are better estimated through production numbers of various European systems. Some of the ATGM production figures pertain to the period after 1980. At the same time, some of the older systems are not even mentioned, assumed retired by 1980. But overall, even with older systems such as the Cobra and Antact mostly retired by the year 1980, it's not unreasonable to estimate that Europe had a few tens of thousands of launchers with over 400,000 guided anti-tank missiles of various kinds. Granted, most such missiles would not even get to hit enemy vehicles, and many would go after various other armored vehicles, not tanks. But it's not implausible that well over 10,000 tanks would be hit with such weapons over the course of the war. Additionally, over a million various unguided rocket-propelled anti-tank grenades were available, which could be useful in ambushes and urban setting fights. The T-55s and T-62s would be very vulnerable to such systems, as their old armor design was simply not meant to oppose anti-tank missiles. Reactive armor add-ons would appear only later. Given all the factors mentioned, the tank rush would fairly quickly slow down to a crawl, with perhaps a few spearheads still going towards France. But there would be no room for a great encirclement. Most likely, within several months into the war, the Soviets would simply choose to stop advancing, after suffering a few times more casualties than NATO, both in manpower and tanks. It would be unlikely that the Soviets would be able to perform much better on the offensive than they did in the World War II, when they lost much more than the Germans. The overall numbers on the front line would simply not allow it. While World War II saw the Soviets desire four to six times more troops when attacking, during the Cold War commanders still desired some three times more forces for a favorable attack. The Soviet push would eventually completely stop, probably still some distance away from Paris. The failed tank rush would not be due to NATO's tanks. Rather, it would be stopped by a myriad of other reasons. From overall troop numbers, cramped battlefields, logistics issues, air superiority issues and NATO's defensive posture. The long-term result of the war would likely be similar to the 1989 result, which was analyzed in those earlier Binka videos. Here's a few more words on the Conflict of Nations game, sponsoring this video.
You can play modern-day maps with modern-day borders and engage in global modern warfare. Or you can try out the historically accurate Cold War map and try to rewrite history. Use conventional weapons or use diplomacy to pacify your neighbors. Or simply nuke everyone. I like that nukes are simulated to leave a lasting effect on population and economy. Units move across the map in real time, often taking hours to achieve goals. There are over 100 kinds of them in the game, beautifully modeled, and over 250 different research items to go through. You must also manage your economy and never fall behind in infrastructure. There's a refined player alliance system in-game, allowing cooperative games and clan challenges. You would have to be a genius to conquer the world all on your own. So get that exclusive gift. Click the link below in the description and get 13,000 gold and one month of premium subscription for free. And remember, Binkov may talk about hypothetical wars, but only real peace can bring us all together.